So I'm going to present a case today at, in an area that I don't necessarily claim to know a lot about. In fact, I would really like uh, people's input. Uh, I had asked Craig Ross to join us uh, just because of the nature of what we're going to talk about and assessments, uh, but uh, Craig unfortunately wasn't able to, um, to join us today. Uh, so let me uh, share, uh, actually, hang on one second here. Um, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, there it is. Uh, and I don't know at what point people can see the screen. Uh, it says everybody can, but uh, if there's any way somebody could uh, in the um, chat or something like that, uh, just let me know that you can see it. That'd be really helpful. Uh, So, okay, excellent. Oh, look at this. Look at all these people <laughs> saying that. So there's now five different people saying that. Fantastic. Uh, thank you everybody for letting me know. Uh, that's wonderful. Okay, so um, today then we are uh, going to talk uh, about social neurodevelopmental disorders in children with severe sensory deficits. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about uh, a boy with uh, really severe blindness. Uh, but uh, I know with um, uh, Kathy uh, Chauvez uh, McKinnon, a psychologist at Robarts and other places, has had uh, has, has spoken uh, to me a lot about this kind of thing in, in the deaf community over the years as well. And what do we attribute to hearing impairment and what do we not? And I think that that becomes really difficult to know what to attribute things to, but also how do we assess people with really severe uh, sensory problems? Uh, Uh, so I uh, have received grant funding from a bunch of organizations. They should have absolutely nothing to do with this talk and no implications or impact at all. Okay, so in coming up with a name, I thought I would uh, pick Bob Sacamano, which is a name that might be recognizable to some of you. Uh, and so if we start with identification, so Bob is a 10 year old male. He lives with his parents and his two older sisters. Uh, he is in a regular grade five class with an educational assistant. Uh, at, a, um, at the school. And he was referred uh, to us sort of in a roundabout way. He was actually seen uh, by Ashley Galloway in the uh, Complex Epilepsy Clinic at London Health Sciences Center. And the mom asked a couple of questions of Ashley. And so uh, following that, a referral was received from the one of the neurologists there for an assessment regarding the possibility of autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability. And typically I would start any presentation personally with talking about what the current symptoms are. But I think in this particular boy, it's really worthwhile to go back early in his development because a lot of things happened that have had an impact on him. Um, so his mother reports the pregnancy was planned and was unremarkable at first. Uh, there were no infections. She didn't have any illnesses. She didn't take any medications. She denied any alcohol or other illicit substances prior to 20 weeks. She had no history of binge drinking prior to that either. Uh, at just shy of 24 weeks gestation. She developed uh, preeclampsia and, and had pregnancy-induced hypertension uh, and was admitted to hospital. I think she received one or two doses of labetalol. Um, but then while she was in hospital, uh, she had a placental abruption. Uh, so the placenta sort of um, tore away from the, uh, the wall of the uterus. Uh, and, he, uh, and she had to go undergo an emergency cesarean section at 26 weeks gestation. Uh, his uh, Bob's birth weight was less than 700 grams, but it was impressive that his APGAR scores were actually not that bad. I think there were seven and eight, uh, which is, I would, I mean, I've never had the birth of a 26 week old child, but that seems pretty impressive to me. Uh, and if it's not, if somebody could let me know just for my own edification uh, and, and knowledge, but obviously it's not an ideal way to start life. Um, so he uh, actually required intubation and external oxygen and was in hospital for almost four months following his birth. Uh, it was almost 120 days that he was in hospital um, and was complicated by many different things. Uh, so uh, he had respiratory distress syndrome uh, early on and had bronchopulmonary dysplasia, so it was abnormal growth. Um, he had uh, it was thought to have sepsis at one or two days of age and received uh, gentamicin and ampicillin, uh, and also had a couple of other courses of antibiotics because of possible infection. Uh, he was found to have, uh, over time, retinopathy of prematurity, uh, 
grade four, which is towards the more severe end and with retinal detachment. Uh, three head ultrasounds were done, but they found no evidence of an intraventricular bleed or periventricular leukomalacia. But even before the end of, uh, even before he was discharged from hospital, he had been seen by ophthalmologists and they uh, determined that he was, I mean, later on he was declared legally blind, but they said that his vision was minimal and that he could perhaps detect shadows and that's about it really. Uh, and so he received laser treatment even before leaving the hospital uh, where they, I think, ablate some of the um, blood supply and things like that to the uh, eyes. And he also had a vitrectomy. So for a kid who was born uh, very early, and in fact, when he left hospital had only just passed his uh, uh, due date, uh, he had that a lot of things happened very early on in the course of his life. But as we'll talk about, certainly the blindness is, I think, what makes it really difficult to assess this boy, in particular because he has very, uh, according to the ICD-10, he would be, he would, the term they use is blind at this level, which means minimal to no vision at all, uh, and certainly just shadows, perhaps. So according to his mother and according to um, his, uh, the records we have at the hospital, uh, his early motor milestones seemed appropriate, um, but his speech milestones were delayed. Uh, and even now, uh, he only has about 50 words, but some of those are mom and dad and things like that. And he may use 20 of them at most. He did not have any single words until after his third birthday. And there were no phrases by the age of five. And I can be fairly confident of that because he saw a, uh, an uh, ear, nose and throat specialist just before his fifth birthday. And he wasn't using phrases at that point. So early on, he... Um, uh, at a young age, became involved with a uh, local child development program in the area where he lives. And his mom said that she has always wondered about autism spectrum disorder from a very young age. So the report from the ENTs said that he had completed, uh, and they said two autism screens, which returned negative. I'm not entirely sure what that means uh, off the top of my head. And, and we don't have those reports, unfortunately. Um, the uh, He was also seen by uh, one of the, uh, by a pediatrician who's here with us today, uh, and uh, apparently uh, it, she felt reasonably strongly that there was a fair amount of evidence for autism, but uh, there was a discussion with the CNIB worker um, uh, who had just started working with this young man at the time and who attended the appointment. And uh, when I say that she emphatically indicated that any ASD symptoms were due to severe visual deficits uh, and not due to autism, uh, I think I might be understating it, uh, this young man's, uh, this boy's mom said that in fact, the uh, CNIB worker had stated that the pediatrician really wasn't aware of what kind of symptoms one might see in blind people and, and perhaps shouldn't be assessing that, which is a pretty strong statement to make. Um, and, uh, but nothing further happened as, as the other um, questions about autism were sort of felt not to exist. Even recently, a letter was received from a primary care per, uh, pediatrician now who said that they don't think uh, his boy has autism either. His mom said that she's wondered about possibly an intellectual disability from a very, very young age, uh, once he was in school anyway, but the school has never completed cognitive testing. And that may be because I'm not even sure how they would do it. And I don't know if the school board would have the expertise in somebody with, with essentially no vision uh, or minimal vision to do any kind of cognitive testing. And the lack of words, just complicates that. Uh, okay, so so when uh, we saw him, um, the question that we were asked by the mom, and in fact, uh, what I actually said was that when, uh, in in when the mom was describing his behavior, actually actually asked the mom if she, what if she had ever wondered about autism, and apparently, mom started crying, saying that you know it's something she had wondered about for a long time, but that people at times had sort of said, no, it's not. It's all due to the blindness, any symptoms that, we, that he has. So in looking at that, what she certainly described was a history of using his parents' hand for communication. Uh, and so getting using her parents, his parents' hands to do things for himself. Uh, he will bring things to his parents to get help, but not really just for the sake of sharing interest. He will use facial expressions at times, but inappropriately also. Uh, so sometimes he'll laugh when other people get hurt or if they are crying. Uh, he has learned over the years when prompted to wave the goodbye to people or to raise his hands to give somebody a high five, but he even still only does that when prompted. And it required a lot of fairly didactic and I think perhaps hand over hand teaching, which 
typically wouldn't we wouldn't do with kids around because people learn by imitation, which is going to be difficult for him. Some other reports that he does seem to like being around other kids, but she was unsure if it was actually about the other children or if it was uh, because he liked the noise that the other kids made and enjoyed the stimulation from that. His mom said that he will play beside other children, and this was reported at school as well, but she has never seen him actually playing with or rarely has seen him playing with his siblings and has never seen him really play with other children, that he would play near them, but not with them. Uh, the other thing, and I, I have a video here of Stevie Wonder because it's the only person I can think of off the top of my head that would be able to demonstrate this, but uh, he did have these sort of um, head movements rolling from uh, right to left. I'm not sure else, else to describe it. Uh, and if we watch Stevie here for a couple of minutes, singing Superstition, this actually, I think it's from an episode of, of uh, Sesame Street of all things. Uh, but if we watch his head, uh, we can see what he does for those of you who haven't seen him do it before. Uh, So it's a sort of head rolling movement. And it, it would appear that when he has to like sing the words, he's able to stop himself and do it. But anytime I've ever, I've ever seen Stevie Wonder on television or, well, the only place I've seen him is on television. It's something that is uh, invariably that he does, I think. And, and we'll come back to it later on because he actually has some comments about that and what it might mean. Um, oh, uh, sorry, the, um, so he has these rotating movements uh, from, right to left perhaps and maybe backwards also he does have occasionally some sort of hand movements where he sort of rolls them and he flaps his hands when he's excited uh he's a bit rigid according to his mom about how things get done but is not uh it's not in a ritualistic kind of way and there's certainly no unusual preoccupations or fixations he likes noises uh and is not bothered by loud noises or by noises of certain perhaps noxious pitches or what might be noxious to others his mother says she's not aw uh, quite aware of what Bob's cognitive capacity is, and she's never really been able to assess that, she doesn't think. At school, he does work, uh, perhaps at a kindergarten level, although she's not clear, and I don't uh, believe he uses Braille, but uh, she acknowledged that the school people are also really hampered by his visual deficits and his minimal verbal ability in terms of actually teaching him. Uh, and, and so perhaps even knowing what he's capable of is really, really difficult for them. On top of that, he does have a history of some aggressive and self-injurious behavior with frustration. Uh, in the past, he's taken both risperidone and aripiprazole, but even at a very low dose, his mom said he was miserable and she described him as being a space cadet. Uh, as he's gotten older, the self-injurious behavior, uh, aggression is pretty minimal now, if at all. Self-injurious behavior has improved as well. Uh, it occasionally happens still, but not very frequently. So, why don't I stop there for a moment and see if uh, people have any thoughts or questions or comments about what the presentation is so far uh, and, and, and about uh, Bob and, and some of his difficulties and, and thinking about how we would really assess autism or intellectual disability in him. Uh, so now, uh, ah, I, should, I, I just forgot what I have to do there. The, um, uh, so Joan Gardner uh, raised her hand first. And so Joan, uh, feel free to uh, go ahead. Okay, sure. I was just going to ask you a little bit about the people who felt strongly that he didn't have autism. And I know you said one of them was the CNIB person, but you said that there were also assessments by clinicians who didn't think so. And did I, they I don't know. So, so this boy has been everywhere. So his parents have actually talked to people around the world when he was much younger about his vision and whether there was anything they could do about it. And they'd actually look into stem cells and things like that. He had an assessment in, uh, let's say, a relatively large border city in the United States, but his mom was unable to get us a copy of that. And he um, had also seen a, a pediatrician where he lived uh, who wondered about autism, but was sort of uh, struck down, let's say, by the CNIV person. Uh, and there was, I don't know what the other assessment that the otolaryngologist referred to was, but his mom said there'd been several cases and, and it was actually at the age of five, it was written on the um, 
report from the ENT surgeon that he had two assessments or screens for autism that were negative. So since that was a contemporaneous report, uh, it would be pretty timely. And so I think we have to accept that as fact. It unfortunately didn't say who it was or where it was. And did anybody have a sense of the reasons for his language impairments? Because that wouldn't necessarily just be automatically part of a visual impairment. Uh, I will, per, at that point in time, no. I mean, that's a very good question and people don't really comment very much. So the, the ENT person, again, they noticed at the age of four that he only had a small number of words and, and hadn't started to put words together. They said that he had, uh, they thought that he, and I guess the report about mom thought that his receptive vocabulary was fairly good, but I think that was mom's, it was, I think that was just an impression as opposed to a, a proper assessment. And it's an interesting question to ask because really nowhere in any of the reports that I saw could did I see anybody really comment upon why he might be lacking in speech. He was followed in the, uh, uh, at the early development clinic, I'm not sure what they call it at the hospital for people who are born very premature. Uh, and they just noted that he wasn't talking, but didn't really comment upon it at all. Yeah, it just seems really inconsistent with the belief that he was functioning at perhaps a kindergarten level because language obviously wasn't the same. So what was he doing at a kindergarten level would be interesting to know. Well, so that's, so I mean, he's 10 now, right? So that was, uh, and so now his mom says it in school, she thinks he's doing kindergarten work, but realistically, I, that was just mom's impression. I don't know what that was based on. And I don't know how they would get him to do any work because he doesn't use Braille. And so I'm not sure what he's able to do in terms of, in terms of work. And, and without having a good assessment of his receptive language, it's really hard to know even what he's understanding and what he's capable of. Okay, I have a couple other questions, but I don't wanna hog it. So I'll let other people take a turn. Sure, okay. So uh, Dr. Mitchell uh, also uh, has her hand raised and, and Dr. Mitchell uh, may or may not have some intimate knowledge of this particular case. Um, so I guess my question though, like at this stage at age 10, um, how, why is this, the, this question so important to the family? Why are they pursuing the autism diagnosis? Uh, what, um, what difference will it make to him and his family um, at this point? Did, did you have a sense of that? So I think that it wasn't so much that she was pursuing it at this point. So, so Ashley Galloway, when she was, uh, she spent three months working with neurologists one day a week. And so she went to the complex epilepsy clinic and, and she was seeing this boy more around uh, as, as from the perspective of, an, of a neurologist, but in talking to mom and watching him, uh, she actually asked the mom about that because even in uh, one of uh, Dr. Andrade's early reports, she commented about, you know, they had a lot of motor stereotypies and things like that. So I think it's something that mom had always wanted about. And I think in part, maybe because of the fact that it doesn't seem as though he is quote unquote, just visually impaired, right? I mean, he's, it doesn't interact much with other people. And, and I think she felt that that didn't really account for his difficulties. Uh, and, and also about the learning process. So I think she wanted to understand him better and perhaps be able to plan for his future better. Yeah, I, and so I think I, just to summarize it, it appears that he's presenting to people with more than can be explained by visual impairment alone. And, right. And, right, okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, and uh, Dr. Pryor uh, also has a uh, uh, her hand up, and I will. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. If you just unmute yourself now, uh, Catherine, it should be okay. Right. I, I think when we look back at that prematurity history and that 700 grams, that we know with many of those children that they do have multiple types of disabilities. So. I think looking at it, I wonder what information the mom was given around the time around what to expect and that we would expect deficits in multiple areas would be not uh, atypical. And so, so I think sometimes when people are perhaps looking at that question of autism, it's because the, the range of symptoms and behaviors that they're seeing aren't being placed into a context for the parent that they can make sense of. And it, um, certainly at sick kids with been working with the NICU with the very low birth weight and low birth weight children, we were seeing this as quite common. And uh, I think 
parents lack a lot of the context around what to expect for the planning. So given the commonality now of autism as a diagnosis, I think people sometimes reach for that rather than understanding that birth history and those complications and what they're seeing. And we would, you know, I think expect to see that there would be very significant social deficits also because he, he can't see his language is very limited. And so it really would be within the context. I think some of those deficits would be relative to the deficits in other areas. Well, and, and you know, it, it's an interesting point, Catherine, because in uh, the reports that I saw from the uh, follow-up clinic or, or developmental clinic, whatever it's referred to as, they tended to be fairly positive. And, and so in the sense that, you know, they felt he was moving fairly well and again, people commented and they only saw him, I think, up until about one or two, but they commented about his receptive language and things, but nothing more than that. And, and I don't know how much that reflects what was actually discussed with mom at the time. I think, uh, Claire, you know, to go back to your question also, as I'm thinking about it, I, there's been a few papers in the last number of years about how people born uh, very premature or very low birth weight have a higher rate of autism uh, than the general population. And so I don't know if mom would have seen that as well. Uh, that might have led to her asking that question. Uh, there is, um, uh, so uh, Dr. Goldberg uh, asked a question, did the CNIV worker uh, use the term blindism? So I want to come back to that because that's actually a, a term that in an article, uh, an interview in the 70s, Stevie Wonder actually used. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if, I mean, I, I'm not sure. There's no uh, report that we could access, unfortunately, from that um, appointment. Uh, and Dr. Mitchell, if we prepare, pretend that you may or may not know something about that appointment, do you have any recollection at all? Uh, vaguely, but, um, you know, not really anything I can add to what you've, um, what you've put there. I'm just going to assume that I saw this child, uh, you know, as a preschooler and, you know, it can be difficult, uh, with sensory impairment to try to sort it out, but I guess I, what I, what I always sort of try to compare the child to is, you know, what someone would look like with the known impairment. So in other words, if, if the visual impairment is all we know about, is this child developing typically for a child with visual impairment? And I think I felt no. And, and I think, you know, Jones pointed out, well, the language impairment. So typically uh, children with visual impairment, if they have appropriately, you know, enriched environment would be developing, you know, typical oral speech. They may have some differences in facial expression, gestures, and so on. But I, I think Joan probably could elaborate on that. But I think those are the kind of things that were striking me. Um, but I, and, and to be honest, I don't really recall the CNIB worker, but um, I, I'd be interested to see what I wrote, actually. <laughs> so, so, so I, I say the mom, mom, spoke uh, and implied that the CNIB worker was perhaps overly adamant about the, all of this stuff, everything being attributable to the, the visual impairment. And again, it's, it's uh, the other thing that we, that I'll come back to in a moment is that his mom or has reported also that, you know, even when people talked to him at one point in time, he wouldn't necessarily turn his head in their direction. He wouldn't necessarily respond to them, even though to the best of our knowledge his hearing is fine, which, Again, that wouldn't account for the visual impairment. Wouldn't account for the the lack of response to his name and things like that. Right, uh, Joan. I mean, it, from what you know, uh, in terms of the language development in people who are severely visually impaired or blind, uh, is it any different from a typically developing child's? I mean, I guess they're not seeing people moving their mouths, obviously. But other than that, are there different uh, milestone times? You know what, I, I don't know and I could look it up. It's not a population with which I work. So I would just be speculating. I mean, I think theoretically there wouldn't be a lot of reason to believe that language would be significantly delayed, not to the extent that you're talking about. Yeah, and, and, and even still, yeah, it's still very, very limited. So so um, the other thing that, that Rhonda Peterson raised, and it, I, if, we come, if we come back to it in a bit, Rhonda, it would be about the whole issue of intellectual disability and cognitive assessment. So what Rhonda had wondered about whether or not a cognitive assessment could be done at W. Ross McDonald, 
uh, which is a school for the blind in Brantford. It is the only school for the blind in Canada, I think. And it's, it, they have a residential component. And we uh, here at Sevier, we saw a boy, a young man a few years ago would actually move from BC uh, in, in order to attend um, that school. But I, I'm not sure that they would be able to, Ron, because a few years ago, I had another uh, patient who had been one of, I think, sex tuplets, actually, and the others had all died. Uh, and, and, and again, he had essentially no vision. Uh, and it seemed he was intellectually disabled, but the people at W. Ross McDonald said that they didn't feel that they had anybody who could assess his cognitive ability at that time anyway. Uh, I would assume, and, and this was a boy who was actually very verbal, um, perhaps repetitive, but nonetheless very verbal, uh, as opposed to somebody who had essentially no speech or very limited use of it for speech, for communication purposes. Uh, okay. If there are no other comments, then why don't we uh, move ahead? Um, Joan, your hand is still up. Uh, is that exercising your arm? Ah, well, lovely. Okay. Uh, so um, <clears throat> the other thing that has really complicated things over the years is his other medical problems. Um, so uh, as a preschooler, uh, and, and perhaps this could account for some of his speech stuff early on, was, uh, although I don't know that he was actually making attempts to speak either, but there were multiple ear infections. He had at least 10 infections prior to the age of six. He had a myringotomy and a placement of tympanostomy tubes at the age of five. Um, and actually that essentially they had no further ear infections after that. At the age of seven, he started to have seizures. Uh, he was initially placed on phenytoin, which was changed to clobazam. He's had a couple of episodes of status epilepticus um, and has been admitted to hospital for that. And over time, his seizures have become much more difficult to treat. So even with sort of being seen in the complex epilepsy clinic by experts, uh, he continues to have a couple of seizures every month. Uh, MRI scan was done. It showed they had uh, bilateral microphthalmia, so an underdeveloped eye, uh, and had dislocated lenses. Um, and uh, atrophy of the optic nerve and the optic chiasm were noted. And an EEG showed that there were what they described as abundant spikes, which probably reflected drug-resistant epilepsy. Uh, so, so this is a young man with a, a whole host of medical and developmental problems and, and teasing them apart is gonna be really, really difficult. So right now, uh, at least the first time we saw him, uh, he was taking valproic acid and topiramate. Um, so uh, in terms of his family history, there was no consanguinity, there were no miscarriages. Uh, he has two older sisters uh, who are, have, there are no developmental anomalies or, or differences. Uh, there's no family history of epilepsy. There's no family history of early developmental impairments. There's no history of language problems or school difficulties. Uh, and they could not identify any family history of intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder. So before I move into sort of his exam, the uh, sort of uh, the, uh, mental status exam, the first time we saw him, uh, are there any further comments or questions about uh, Bob uh, at this point in time? Uh, Claire, I think your microphone is on. Not that I want to single you out, and I apologize for that. Sorry. Uh, no, no. The, um, uh, all right. So, question from Dr. Goldberg about is he deaf? Uh, and no, because he will at times respond when his name is called. And um, his mom actually said she'd never had any particular concerns about his hearing. And I think they have done the... Um, uh, auditory brainstem reflexes uh, to assess his hearing, and it seems to be within the normal range. So there's no evidence of a uh, of a hearing impairment. He has a question about what the impact of the early uh, ear infections was. I, I don't know, and unfortunately, it's not clear because I couldn't find any reports of his hearing being assessed during that period of time. That it was only later on that the ABRs were done and they were found to be normal. Any other questions or comments about uh, Bob? Okay, uh, and you know, Rhonda, your question about cognitive assessments and how we would do that is something I'm gonna come back to you and, and turn around for yourself and Dr. Pryor, because that 
is a huge question, really. Um, okay, so uh, so when we saw him, uh, it was early this year uh, in the complex epilepsy clinic. So uh, his height was uh, well, his his, um, his measurements were as you see. So they're all on the smaller side. Uh, he wore sunglasses in the times I've seen him. He's always had them on. He had a red mark on his forehead from banging his head the previous day. I can't recall exactly what the issue was, um, what his mom had said. Certainly he had no dysmorphic features. Uh, he didn't have any evidence of tics. There were no abnormal involuntary movements. Um, so he didn't greet anybody when they came into the room. Uh, generally, when people spoke to him or called his name, he didn't turn his head uh, and didn't um, respond to them. He didn't initiate any interactions with anybody other than his mother. Uh, and the only way he did that was at one point he got up and sat in her lap and took her mom's hand uh, and used it to sort of pat his face gently. And another time, I guess his mother had brought some candies or I think some Tic Tacs actually. Um, and each time he had finished with one, he would sort of lean, move his hand over slowly, find his mom's hand, and then move that to where he thought the uh, candy was as a way of indicating that he wanted more. My understanding is that he does have the word for more, but didn't use it. Uh, he flapped his hands a few times. Uh, he rolled his head side to side. He um, uh, and he rocked back and forth uh, in his chair uh, as well. It's, this seemed to happen more when he was listening to a song that he liked. And sometimes he sort of waved his hands around also. He um, was really not very cooperative when attempts were made to get his reflexes so he wouldn't move and things like that and to make them more the easier to assess. And he um, also made uh, some humming noises to himself. Uh, no words or word approximations were heard, but he did hum to himself loudly at times, particularly when he became agitated and wanted to leave. When he did get up to leave, there was no, uh, so as there had been no um, Acknowledgement of people or response people when they when he when they came into the room he didn't acknowledge people or, or say anything when they when he left uh, and it was noted that he walked on his toes. So, at this point in time, I guess the question would be, what is the differential and what do we want to consider and how are we going to assess him? So, I think to make it easy, I will throw out the first two that are very straightforward. So, he has epilepsy, and the term in ICD-10 is he has blindness, which is binocular, and I think blindness. In the ICD, I believe means that your vision has to be less than a certain number, but at, at equal to or slightly better than just being able to see shadows. And so I think that would be the correct ICD-10 term. What other things do we want to consider or what other things would people think about with regards to his um, differential diagnosis or things that we'd want to consider and perhaps rule out? And I think not just from a mental health or psychiatric perspective, but also from a developmental perspective at this point in time. Yeah, Joan, go ahead and thank you for putting up your hand. <laughs> well, I think it's already been said by Rhonda really, but I really would like some more information about his cognitive profile. And I think there's at least questions that could be asked about the experiences that he's had for to facilitate learning and sort of how he's responded to those to, to tease some of that out, even if you can't do a formal assessment. So what, what kind of things would you wanna know about when you say you'd like to know more about his cognitive style or his learning, what, what would you wanna know? Well, just at a really fundamental, you know, his hearing continues to perplex me in terms of how much of a role, you know, if he was sort of intermittently deaf in those first six years, but you said he didn't respond to his mom. Did he, does he respond to no, environment? No, sorry, he, he didn't respond to other people coming or, in. Sorry, room, yeah, to other people. Does he respond to other um, auditory signals? So is he yeah, responding yeah. to environmental? His mom, his mom said she has not had any concerns about his hearing. Yeah, so I, I think ruling that out is, suggest the hearing isn't the issue. And, and so it leads you to think that perhaps something else is. And then what other forms of communication have been attempted? So have they tried to teach him sign? Have they tried to teach him braille? Have they used an object-based communication system? And, and how has that gone? Because again, I think kids with cognitive potential, although having sensory deficits, probably would understand some cause and effect learning at least. And it sounds like he hasn't. And so I'd be curious about why. So. Uh... I don't know that he's been taught sign and, and 
I don't mean to sound like a smart aleck, but I think it'd be very, I guess you could teach more uh, to somebody who can't see, but I don't know how you would teach the other signs. Yeah, I mean, you could I, do it I hand think over you could hand. Teach through, I think you could teach through hand over hand for him at least to use signs, right? To yeah. um, elicit the things that he needs. So yeah, I, not signs obviously for other people to use with him. He wouldn't see them, but um, but certainly some some cause and effect strategies that he could use to share messages with other people. And it sounds like he doesn't have that. And I wonder if anybody has tried. And and then what does well, that tell the, us? This, this story takes many twists. But the um, it the other when you ask about signs, my experience has been with, and we don't know his cognitive ability. But let's say for a moment they have some cognitive impairment is that at times those signs in, in some people that we see with cognitive parents become really idiosyncratic. So they're unique to them. And, and so people who know them will understand it, but not necessarily anybody else. And so it's, it's, it's helpful with those people, but not outside of that sort of circle. Uh, as it turns out though, he did have a speech output device. It's not, uh, I, and his mom was going to bring it in, but it had broken and she was gonna make a video of it, of him using it and hasn't been able to get it to us because it hasn't been repaired. But it, it's not really like proloquo from the way she describes it, but he does have a speech device, which when he pushes certain buttons, he will, uh, it, will, uh, it will say uh, what he wants. And he, um, but his mom said he hasn't used it much. And I don't know how much of an effort has been made to get him to use it. And I don't know who has taught him how to use it, right? So was it a speech and language pathologist or was it somebody else who may not have the knowledge or experience? Yeah, I just think it speaks to sort of that social connectedness and intentionality of, of communication to help perhaps tease apart the pieces. Yeah, I mean, I think his mom said he had some words that he could use, but would generally require prompting to do it. So I'm not sure he, at least when we saw him the first time, that he understood the purpose of it, really. Yeah. Does he not know how to communicate or does he not know why to communicate? Yep. Well, I don't know. Do you have the answer for that? Well, I, I think you'd have to look at what's been tried to sort of try to figure that out. Yeah, and I think that that becomes the question really. Uh, Dr. Pryor, you, uh, uh, I think your hand was up and uh, I keep clicking ask to unmute. Uh, sorry, yeah, Catherine, all you have to do is unmute yourself. There you go, sorry. Yes, I, I think in addition to the uh, comments that Joan was making, one of the things we'd wanna be thinking about from a cognitive perspective, and we've done this with some children with very low vision is, looking at what he explores and where he goes. So even though he's a little older now, but at a younger age, certainly when you put play materials in front of a child and guide them to um, look at the different parts or maybe guide them through some imitations, seeing if they're picking up and understanding play actions, extending that, what are they exploring? Where are they going? How are they adapting to the environment generally? Uh, because it sounds as if there are um, some some broad-based deficits. And again, with a premature birth weight at that weight, those things would not be uncommon. So I think it would be one of the first things we'd be really wanting to look at is what is really the understanding of the environment. And when he, if he has more trouble exploring, when things are brought to him and play materials and things are modeled and, and introduced to him, is he picking up on those things? Is he remembering those things? Is he using those things? Because it would give us some idea then of what other things that he might uh, be able to adapt to in the environment. And the other thing we could do from a perspective of um, trying to assess what his ability levels are would be to run an adaptive assessment and then really try to tease it out qualitatively to see what things would be most impaired by vision and remove those to see what other things is he doing that we might expect for someone who also uh, is not seeing the environment in the same way. But so, again, given that history. No, yeah. go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I, again, given that the, the profile of prematurity and the early um, inconsistencies in hearing and the various things that he's experiencing and the epilepsy and so on, um, it would be very reasonable to be trying to see how he's adapting to the environment. Was he exploring? How is he responding to learning with concrete materials um, to see if the nonverbal reasoning is stronger perhaps than his verbal expression? 
So, and unfortunately, we don't have that information. He, um, uh, I don't know about the exploring the environment stuff. And and we had asked the school people to send us some information, and we we didn't hadn't received it the last uh, before now. And I don't know when you talk about you know what kind of things they've tried teaching. The sense I get from the mom, and and she seems like she's knows what's going on and is and is pretty in touch with stuff. Was that it wasn't clear how much guidance the educators had received from other people about how to educate him. I, I think he's a mystery and a puzzle to everybody around what his ability is. And I think people aren't sure, so they're not sure what to do. The uh, But if I can put it back to you, Kath, I mean, how, and, and to Rhonda as well, I mean, how do you think we, is it possible to assess his cognitive ability, do you think? I think we, um... It, through those through those methods, we would get some qualitative information that would let us uh, get an understanding of what the level of reasoning non-verbally and independence would likely be, which would help us to plan for the child in terms of the levels of support. Because I guess mom's question was around what should we be planning for? So there aren't uh, specific tests where we could... Um, assess IQs as a, in, in a most standardized way, but we have done similar things that I described before in terms of introducing materials, um, trying to teach some sequences of activities, play, look at what they're exploring on their own in the environment, running an adaptive, which would give us a pretty uh, good measure of what the person's level of independent functioning and reasoning was. But, but even with the something like the Vineland, what off the top of your head, and it, maybe it's not easily known, but you know, what percentage of items on the Vineland require vision to assess? Well, that's what I'm saying. You then want to go through qualitatively once you looked at the answers to get information. And if you took some of those um, items that require vision to problem solve and look at other things that would be less dependent on that, you might get some understanding also of what the level of independence was. So you'd have to do some really more qualitative as, uh, assessment, not just a number, because it could it was it's going to be influenced by um, the visual impairments, but it's not just visual impairments. So you'd really want to take an item by item analysis of it, look at what things were less impair or impacted by the vision, and also to get a sense of that, and then test individually with the individual working with different types of materials to see what things they were able to problem solve or learn. And, and um, when you're modeling that hand over hand and or independent exploration. Well, and, 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 you know, it's interesting that you said that because it, it sounds like it's doable it would require a lot of creativity, I think. And so what mama said is that she has asked the school about some kind of cognitive assessment or even a, just a developmental assessment to see where he's at and they haven't acted upon it. Now, we know that school boards have long waiting lists and with COVID and stuff, it's made it much, much longer. But the way she described it, there wasn't a sense that they were planning on doing anything in the near future. Uh, Rhonda uh, Peterson also has her hand up. So Rhonda, if you, uh, I will allow you to talk. If you wanna unmute yourself, um, that'd be great. Uh, although now I don't know where Rhonda went to. Uh, I can't see her. So uh, while we're waiting, uh, Claire, what uh, did you want to say something? Uh, well, I was just looking at your slide of differential diagnosis, and, and we're sort of talking about this, but, um, you know, I think intellectual disability for sure. And, and you know, we've heard the the creativity required to try to assess that. I think it's also possible that he could have a specific area of deficit, like a speech and language disorder. There's nothing to that says he couldn't have that in the, the description, which might explain some of his developmental trajectory. And then, um, you know, we always have to think about the environment, so psychosocial factors. So if there was severe neglect um, or lack of opportunity that um, that can cause some interesting and unusual behaviors in children. So I, it sounds like the parents and, and you know have done everything that they, they could and he's had schooling and so on. So I think it's unlikely, although you, know, you do point out that 
um, if people really haven't understood him, he may not have had the opportunities that allowed him to develop to the best that he he could so far. So there may be some environmental factors that are contributing to his presentation. So the sense I get, Claire, and again, I've only met the mom once, uh, is that they had done they've done a lot of things with him, uh, and I think they were seen they may have been seen by somebody such as yourself. I, I think within the first, uh, well, I think they were seen certainly at, 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 in a child development center within the first five or six months of life. Uh, and um, and I think you had seen, uh, you may have seen him at a very young age as well. So I think the parents have certainly done a lot in terms of assessments. Uh, in seeing him, he doesn't strike me as the kind of kid that we would worry about neglect or the lack of environmental exposure. But having said that, I don't know that he is um, initiating a lot of things and I don't know how much enthusiasm he has for stuff. And so it's possible that people may have misinterpreted that as, as him just not wanting to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think, yeah, it'd be very hard to assess uh, as well. And I, and I don't know at school how much is included either in, in other activities. Um, I think that, uh, Rhonda is having a difficult time unmuting herself. Uh, but uh, Rhonda, the other thing you can try is if you move your microphone, uh, sorry, your um, your mouse up to the top of the screen as I am or down to the bottom, the part that you need to unmute yourself may then become visible because I think it automatically hides itself. If not, Rhonda, if you want to type it into the chat area or in the, your comments into there or into the chat uh, or into the Q&A, that'd be great. Uh, and uh, let's see. Um, Jennifer McLean has written a great article in Brain Sciences by uh, uh, Molinaro about autism and visually impaired children about this topic with review of literature and directions for future research. But in that article, Jennifer, is that people with low vision or is that people with no vision and and would that and what difference would that potentially make so in the chat if people are interested there is uh, jennifer does have the uh, the reference written down there uh and rhonda i will Ask you to unmute yourself again. Your hand is still up. Um, and uh, are there any other uh, questions right now uh, that we can try and answer? Oh, Rhonda, there you are. You're unmuted now. You should be able to go ahead and talk. Oh. Hello? Okay, so if I um, can, let me just move on with sort of what Claire had said though, and we could sort of work through those things. So in terms of the differential, what I had also included would be a language disorder, um, a stereotypic movement disorder with the head in his hands, although I don't know that I've ever really made that diagnosis. Question is mom had about autism spectrum disorder and then intellectual disability, and, and I think that as we've seen the last two, maybe the more difficult to, um, to assess in some ways, although the article that Jennifer McLean recommended may, uh, it sounds like has some really interesting suggestions. So, you know, the question about language disorder though, it says, you know, the, the DSM says difficulties are not attributable to hearing or other sensory impairment or another medical or neurological condition are not better explained by intellectual disability or global developmental delay. So I guess, Joan, in somebody such as this boy, from what you know, uh, do you think, uh, that is it possible that those other things would be a better explanation for his language problems, given that we actually don't know what his cognitive ability is? Yeah, I, I think that language disorder certainly could exist. I think that his language is not accounted for based on the blindness and the epilepsy. I, you know, a quick Google search there while you were talking would suggest that folks with visual impairment certainly do acquire language. It tends to be a little bit more self-centered and a, a little bit more concrete, but certainly I think the severity of this kiddo's language disorder um, is remarkable. And so I would really wanna know again about his 
nonverbal uh, skills in terms of the potential for an overall intellectual disability versus a language disorder. Um, the other question I was going to ask, though, is what's the age difference between this kiddo and his sisters? Because, again, I think you talked about he's not really interested in kids outside, but, you know, siblings tend to be pretty forgiving with kids with impairments and and they tend to elicit skills that perhaps, you know, you don't see when kids are playing just with general peers. So, so did you have a sense of the relationship with the sisters? Uh, so it's two or three years. And I think that they try to interact with him. He just doesn't initiate much with them. Uh, and, you know, what you were saying a second ago, Joan, about his nonverbal intelligence, I, I'm not even sure how we would assess that, though, because it, the way it's assessed in standard measures, and I don't want to steal anybody's thunder, but it requires vision. Oh, well, I think the things that Dr. Pryor talked about, right, yeah. I think she had some really great, you know, ideas about how you could at least qualitatively assess that. Uh, and so Dr. McLean had said that the article that she put in the chat about um, uh, autism and people with visual impairments, it doesn't break it down uh, is the way I've re understood what Jennifer said. It doesn't break uh, autism in, in people with varying degrees of visual impairment down. So not necessarily is it easier or harder with more or less severe visual impairments. So a language disorder is, is one possibility depending upon his cognitive ability. The second, uh, it would be a, um, a stereotypic movement disorder. Although again, with, with these kind of things where I'm trying to explain little bits and pieces without actually explaining the whole presentation. So what the stereotypic movement disorder criteria says that repetitive motor behavior is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or neurological condition and is not better explained by another neurodevelopmental or mental disorder. And I don't think that in this boy that criteria is but at least the head movements. I'm not so sure about the hands. And this is, um, uh, something that, that, that Ben Goldberg uh, brought up earlier. So again, with Stevie Wonder, so this is uh, an article from 1974 in Esquire, not that I would ever pretend to read Esquire on a regular basis and certainly not in 1974, but in this uh, little part that I've highlighted in particular, he actually talks about blindisms, uh, such as rolling his head and things. Uh, and he, um, he describes it as a way of getting rid of excess energy. I've I've never heard of that. I mean, when I've heard it described before, it's perhaps been as a way of getting sensory input, but uh, obviously he has experienced this and I, I haven't. The other thing is I think that he was blind almost from birth and, and completely blind, so may have had more severe ones. Uh, and going back to what I said earlier about Dr. Chauvaz McKinnon, I think again, it's the same thing that I think, and I don't want to speak for it, but, but I think she's concerned that at times people may attribute certain things to deafness that may not necessarily be accounted for by deafness. But I think certainly with this boy, I think the way he rolls his head could perhaps be accounted for by the, by the visual impairment. And it would be sort of a blindism. Uh, I don't know about the hand movements and how common they are in people with, um, with visual impairments, but just reading through it a bit yesterday that I think what you'll often see is people poking, like rubbing their eyes and things like that. Uh, and certainly I've seen people turning from side to side uh, and have and rolling their heads, but not other hand movement kind of things. Uh, I mean, does uh, anybody else have any thoughts about whether or not some of the hand movements could be accounted for by uh, the the by the visual impairment? And is it reasonable to assume that the head movements are related to the visual impairment or a compensation for that, as opposed to being part of something else? What's the quality of the hand movements? So when he's excited, he will flap his hands. Uh, he will, uh, he rocks back and forth, particularly when he's listening to music, but sometimes he just sort of rolls his hands like this while he's doing something. And, and if a certain speech and language pathologist had been present yesterday morning, uh, actually the girl we saw did the same thing, but doesn't have a visual impairment. And may or may not have ASD. So again, I don't know that that's, you know, a, a diagnostic feature that is a given. You know, if Stevie Wonder is saying he moves his head around because he's got lots of excess energy, maybe he's just moving his hands around because he's got lots of excess energy. So he's, no, he's, he's talking about rolling his head around. And he, well, I think he, that what he, he talks about- his head, maybe this kiddo rolls his hands. Except though, I mean, over the years, and I wouldn't, I don't pretend to know a lot of blind people or have seen them, but the ones that I have seen, uh, often with intellectual disabilities as well, uh, but without a clear diagnosis of autism would often roll their heads like that also. Uh, and I think that's where when, um, when Dr. Goldberg was asking about the idea of a blindism 
And if you if you look up blindism in Google, they talk a lot about people rolling their heads back and forth. So I guess there's no way to definitively prove that something is due to the visual impairment as opposed to being independent of it. But I think given the commonness of that sort of head rolling movement, I think it would be perhaps premature to assume that it's not related to the visual impairment and, and looking for some kind of sensory um, input. Uh, yes, Dr. Pryor, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, seeing, seeing the more common head movements with individuals who are visually impaired, but thinking about the potential for um, repetitive movements for those with intellectual disabilities, that those things certainly, like the hand flapping, and those things are obviously more common if there's more significant impairments as well in the intellectual functioning of people. So it could, and it, it sounds like from the level of independence that he was showing that he was not approaching uh, age appropriate if he's showing skills at half his chronological age. So that might also be accounted for the hand flapping by the level of the intellectual disability as well. Yeah, certainly, yeah, I would agree, Catherine. I don't think that the hand movements and things, I don't think that in any way would be accounted for by the visual impairment, although I'm not by any means an expert in this area, but I would certainly wonder about the, the head movements, uh, perhaps being more accounted for by that. Uh, okay, so let me move on because actually there are a few other things that have happened in the meantime. So, um, I think it's freezing over there. Uh, so, Interestingly enough, that um, we were supposed to have, uh, actually was supposed to see Bob a second time in person, but it was done by video as he uh, had had a vagus nerve stimulation device implanted shortly after the, uh, after the first appointment. And it uh, actually shortly after, but also just before the, um, the scheduled second appointment. And so vagus nerve stimulation for anybody who's not aware is a, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but it's a way of, I think it's used for people with, uh, resistant or perhaps uh, intractable seizures. Uh, and what his mother had noticed very quickly after it was implanted, even before it was sort of turned up all the way or whatever the term is, was that his seizures certainly seemed better. Uh, she also reported and people at school reported that he was talking more and using more words. Now that's a very relative thing, right? So he was using a few more words and seemed to be talking a bit more. It's not as though he was now using five word phrases or sentences, but he was using the words that he had a bit more. Um, he, his mother and his sisters also know that he seemed to be interacting more with his sisters, uh, not necessarily with them, but certainly wanted to see, be more around them and was more responsive to them. He was more compliant. He responded to his request, the request more quickly. He seemed more interested in what was going on around him. And at this point, he actually seemed, according to his mom, to start, he was turning and looking in the direction of people who were talking to him. So there'd been a pretty significant change at that point. So then we saw him uh, probably a few, uh, two or three weeks ago at the hospital um, and his mom reported there'd been further uh, improvements. His speech remained very, very limited, um, but he was now using the speech output device more. He had made gains in it at home and at school. Uh, again, very, very limited still, um, but she also reported that one day he had, um, I guess there's a button for it uh, that will say the word happy and he had come over to his mom sort of leaned his head against her shoulder and just pushed the word happy repeatedly and, and sort of had smiled at, at her. Um, he seemed to spend more time around people than previously, seemed to enjoy being with them. Uh, and, and again, people at school had noticed this uh, and was perhaps initiating more, still typically to get his needs and wants met, but not always. But the family was also, in the past, he had been fairly um, solitary, I guess. And, and his family, mom had reported in the last month or so, they've been able to go out and do a few things as a group, which they hadn't been able to previously, including going to a London Knights game. So, you know, again, it's hard to know how much of this is a biased view because of knowing that things have changed. But, but the fact of the matter is, his seizures were also much better controlled. And I think in the previous month when we saw him, I don't know if he'd had any seizures um, at all. Uh, and so it'd been a significant um, change uh, noted by people at school. So uh, Dr. Mitchell wondered about what the MRI showed. So the MRI um, uh, showed that he had, uh, actually an MRI and a CT showed the atrophy of the optic nerve and the optic chiasm and um, that the eyes were 
very small and underdeveloped and, and the lenses were dislocated. Other than that, they showed nothing abnormal at all. So there were no findings other than it, the visual stuff. Uh, there is a note from Dr. Andrade that she wondered about, uh, and I can't remember the term that she used. She wondered about something else, but wasn't convinced. But at least for the radiologist, the reports were both that there was no other findings on the MRI scan. So, you know, at this point in time, I, I, and I must say, so we, uh, when, when I saw him um, at the hospital a few weeks ago, he sat beside his mom. He, despite what his mom had said about how he was more responsive, he certainly didn't respond when I called his name, uh, didn't really do much, but sit beside his mom. Uh, she didn't, didn't have the speech output device because it was broken. Uh, but it certainly didn't initiate anything and, and frankly just sat there for half an hour. And as far as I could tell, didn't really do much of anything. Um, it was not disruptive, was not resistant to doing anything, but certainly didn't do anything on his own. His mom said that he was quite tired that day because he hadn't slept well the night before. Uh, and I suppose the fact people at school had also reported changes is noteworthy, but certainly to me, he certainly didn't seem very interactive. Um, and so question from uh, Vikram about genetic testing. Surprisingly enough, he has not had genetic testing that I can see any evidence of. Uh, which is rather surprising. And his mom has actually asked about it, uh, but it hasn't been done that I can see. Uh, certainly at London Health Science Center, there's no record of any microarray being done. It might've been done by somebody else and sent off to a different hospital where it was done, but I can't see any mention of it anywhere, which surprised me, frankly. So at this point, you know, based upon what mom says, I think it would you'd certainly wonder about how much the social difficulties were driven by the seizures and things. Having said that, he certainly didn't appear interactive to me, but based upon what his mom said, it would make you me wonder less about autism. Uh, and certainly she said she wondered less about it as well and seemed less concerned. Still had significant concerns about his cognitive ability um, and, and, and his learning and, and his future as well. Uh, and so even if we say, okay, he doesn't have autism, which I'm not confident of, but even if we, just say that for argument's sake, I think we're still left with the question of the intellectual disability and, and what to make of that and how to assess it. Uh, and, and certainly Dr. Pryor has made some great suggestions um, with regards to that. Uh, uh, so is the, uh, so Dr. Goldberg um, pointed out very correctly, which I had forgotten about, was that vagus nerve stimulation is also held, used as a treatment for depression. But Ben, do you happen to know if it's used, I, I don't know, anything about vagus nerve stimulators other than what they're called. Uh, and so when it's used for people with depression and refractory depression, is it, is it used in the same way or is the, uh, the impulses, are they set at a different frequency or do you have any idea about that? Uh, okay, so while we are, waiting for, uh, for Dr. Gover's response. What other uh, thoughts people have now given what... Um... Okay, so Dr. Goldberg said uh, he's not sure about whether it is different or not. And I, I'm not sure. Actually, I have a, um, a resident working with me right now. He's uh, off this week, but he spent, uh, I think he did an elective at Emory University in Atlanta for a month or two working in their refractory depression unit where they've been doing stuff on vagus nerve stimulation. So it'd be a, an interesting question to ask him about and whether it differs. Because are you proposing then, Ben, though, that perhaps part of the issue maybe have been a low mood or depression, I suppose? Um, okay, so... Uh, and uh, Dr. Goldberg, uh, in his humility, uh, says he's not sure. So, I mean, but, but it's an interesting question, certainly. And I, I think that, uh, thank you for raising that, Ben, because I'd forgotten about that entirely. Are there any other comments about what uh, people's thoughts about his diagnosis uh, and other thoughts about assessment? That certainly, I think, you know, Dr. Pryor's suggestions are fantastic. And I will uh, let, um, and we can talk with mom about that the next time we see her. Um, are there any other thoughts or comments people have about uh, about this young man? Uh, 
Uh, yep, Catherine, what would you like to say? Um, given the information that the seizures appeared to be intractable, it perhaps wouldn't be surprising that there might be some inconsistent language use. I wonder if it's an, a language disorder or more um, that his verbal reasoning and his nonverbal reasoning are both impaired. Uh, but certainly if there's a lot of seizure activity occurring, we might also expect some inconsistencies in his performance, which would make, which would be important to consider with his day-to-day -day functioning regarding, you know, what he's doing overall and his language use. So I, I would wonder if it's more uh, an intellectual disability that involves both verbal reasoning and the nonverbal reasoning and certainly impacted also by his seizure disorder against a history of prematurity and so on and blindness. And, and you know, it's, it's a really interesting point again, Catherine, because the uh, in one of her earlier notes, uh, Dr. Andrade, had made a comment that she wondered about, and I, I don't have it in front of me now, and I always get Landau Kleffner and Lennox Gastaut syndrome mixed up. And I know one of them is perhaps associated with uh, a loss of skills, but uh, and unfortunately I can't remember which, and I can't remember exactly what Dr. Andrade said, but I think the idea that it might be some sort of um, broader based developmental problems secondary to epilepsy and the neurological abnormalities associated with it certainly was raised. I couldn't see any further comments about it afterwards. I, I, it wasn't, doesn't seem to have been raised since then. Um, uh, for some reason, Claire, I can't, uh, there is something over you that I can't, I can, I keep clicking ask to unmute uh, and I can't see whether you're muted or not. Oh, uh, you know, you're not muted actually, Claire. So if you wanna go ahead. Um, okay. I think I didn't know I, I raised my hand, but anyway, um, I guess my thought at this point is that this boy has a pretty significant impairment. And if the, you know, we're really talking about the cause at this point and the one really treatable cause is epilepsy, which he appears to have had some improvement, but, um, you know, as you describe him, he still has a lot of impairment and if we're gonna hypothesize that he's had, you know, temporal or parietal lobe seizures all this time that's been impairing his language, it's hard to imagine that that will completely resolve given that he's now 10. So I think to answer the parent's question about how much support he's gonna need, I think we can tell them that it's going to be high. Um, and then the rest is really more about trying to understand why. And I guess the question is really how much will that contribute to his overall management if we know why? Um, and, I, and I think we could probably um, discuss that, but even, even the improvements you describe are you know, far from what we'd expect of a typically developing child um, without a visual impairment and with a visual impairment. I, I, you know, I have had um, several patients who were premature uh, 25 to 27 weeks, retinopathy, prematurity, blindness. And I can think of one family in particular, two sisters, and they were highly functional kids who, if you didn't know they were blind, it would be hard for the average person to pick it up right away. Um, you know, they were quite bright. Um, so that probably helped them quite a bit, um, but they're quite different than what you're describing this boy. But Claire, if, by the way, which one is it that I'm thinking of? Is it Lennox Gastel or Lando Kleffner? Lando, Lando Kleffner is, is a chronic seizure disorder that impairs language and it's extremely rare. Um, but when you treat it, it does allow language to, to be much better. Because I think there was some question, and I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but about Jenny McCarthy and her son having autism, I think there was some question about whether he actually had Lando Kleffner syndrome. I, I don't know who raised that question, but I just remember reading that. The, uh, but then if, if the seizures were a significant contributor to his, his sort of delayed development, would we expect, you think, in the next year that the gains he would make would be more than we would expect? Well, I think you also have to think about a brain that's had no, like hasn't had the, the practice and experience of using language for 10 years. Yeah, so I'm not, I, I certainly don't think he would be back to normal by any means, but do you think that in the next year he may make 
if it was the seizures that were the cause of this, which I'm not necessarily implying, but if it was, would we expect that the gains in the next year would be greater than they've been in the past year? Uh, yes, but but I guess my, you know, I'd want to be pessimistic, but I think you want to be realistic with the family that it that yes, we would expect him to make some gains, but it may not be as much as they hope, but you know, follow up will help us out. And, and I, I should say, I don't mean to imply that the mom, when she wonders about the outcome, what, you know, is he going to live independently? I think, I think that she is quite aware that he's going to need support all his life. I think it's more, her question is more the degree of support. What, what can she expect that he'll be able to do later on in life? I think she has acknowledged for herself that he is a, a very disabled young man, unfortunately, uh, and that will require lots of support as he, um, as he gets older. So uh, I mean, I think it's certainly an opportunity for more intensive intervention, you know, especially in the area of language, if this is what's being observed. Um, I actually don't know the long term outcome of uh, vagal nerve stimulation and intractable epilepsy, like does it continue forever? Or does it wear off? Or what happens? So I, I think I have no idea. Right now, he's certainly doing better. And so it'd be great to get a bit more intervention for sure to help them. So so Joan and Rhonda have both very uh, bravely and very uh, kindly offer their services for an assessment. The problem is this boy wasn't seen here at CPRI. Uh, although we can certainly talk to him about that. Um, and I will say nothing further about that particular issue right now. Um, the, but certainly your, your record, your, the, the volunteering of both of you is, is uh, acknowledged and, and, and I'm grateful for that. So Vikram, you, uh, I just, um, uh, you can uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm speaking from an adult uh, perspective. So I mainly deal with adults with intellectual disability. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I, um, I want to say that it's very important uh, that he has uh, um, a developmental uh, disorder diagnosis. So clearly uh, based on information you provided, he has uh, impaired ability to learn uh, my experience is that if he had the ability, um, generally school system and generally uh, supports um, around the child, uh, they would have recognized or and identified different ways to help him learn and he would have learned. So obviously it looks like he is currently significantly impaired. And uh, certainly um, one of the previous speakers talked about uh, adaptive abilities and uh, uh, qualitative um, assessment of adaptive abilities uh, will certainly help. And based on your presentation, uh, I get a feeling that the impairment is much more than what you would expect just with uh, blindness or uh, with uh, language disorder or blindness plus language disorder. So the, uh, here, I, I really would vouch for a diagnosis of intellectual disability uh, because once he becomes, as long as he's a child, he's got a lot of uh, services around him. When he becomes an adult, uh, unfortunately, the funding streams uh, uh, follow uh, the diagnosis, either an autism or intellectual disability. And uh, again, uh, I know is uh, 10 years and uh, uh, treatment of epilepsy might to some extent improve, uh, improve his ability and I can't imagine significantly uh, improving but still um, uh, the um, abilities that they, uh, you know, the, the level to which he um, functions now um, would meet the criteria for intellectual disability uh, even if the causes uh, uh, underlying brain damage, epilepsy, other related phenomena. So I know it's difficult to uh, do IQ assessment, but I guess this is an exceptional case where we um, make a, a case for this diagnosis despite um, cognitive IQ assessment. You know, I think that's a fantastic point. And, and perhaps, you know, I, that's what I was trying to get at earlier and I wasn't very successful when, when Claire was asking about why the question was being asked. I, he does not have a developmental diagnosis at this point in time. and the sense I get is that all the support he gets in school is around the visual impairment and the, um, or what they're focusing on is the visual impairment and safety because of epilepsy, as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, developmental um, disability. Uh, and so I think that that is, yeah, neglecting, as you, as you say, potentially is a, a very significant um, aspect of his impairment and, and isn't being addressed. I, I, I say, I think that mom, uh, I mean, and she's the person who's raised this several times, I think, with the school, she, she says, 
Uh, and I'm just not sure the school feels they know what to do or or how to go about doing it. But but I think your point, Vikram, is very well is an excellent one. Are there other questions or comments? So Joan and Rhonda, are you guys implying then that we, meaning I, should talk to the mom about a referral being made here for an assessment? I don't mean to be so presumptuous as to think that Ron and I are going to solve it for you. I just think he's a really interesting case. And yep. I think there's, I think there's work that could be done. Well, and, and you know, and I don't know, uh, and I should, I don't know what kind of speech and language therapy involvement he's had recently, if, if any. Um, and now the one potentially uh, contentious issue is that his pediatrician is quite adamant that he doesn't have autism uh, and so that might create difficulties. But I, I think, yeah, having a full team assessment would be really, really, first of all, from an academic intellectual perspective on our part, really fascinating, but potentially of significant value to the mom because she's the person who's been asking these questions also and, and to the whole family, really. And, and I should, you know, to, to Vikram's point also, uh, when I say that he is 10 years old, that is partly for the purposes of, uh, I don't want to say blinding people to his uh, identity, but let's say, uh, concealing his identity, and it's possible that he is several years older than 10. So his development is perhaps even further behind than what I've let on. And when I say it's possible, I mean, really, it is. Just highlights the need for that diagnostic label to access services in the near future. Well, except we would never make a diagnosis purely for service purposes. Uh, no, but if it applies, you would want yeah. to make sure. Well, that but, you know, in some ways, that's the really remarkable thing. And it, it, I really hadn't sort of gelled for me until Vikram said it. But the fact that he doesn't have a developmental diagnosis and hasn't had a developmental assessment, really, is, is quite remarkable. Uh, hasn't had a developmental assessment in the last 10 years, I guess I should say. Well, since he was three. Ish. Okay, so uh, are there any other comments or thoughts? I mean, you know, I, I think, first of all, for myself, just in thinking about this boy, that the, the comments and the discussion has been incredibly helpful uh, to think about him in ways we can assess him. But he also is, you know, remarkably complex, but this is real life, perhaps. Um, I heard Gabrielle Carlson once say, and I've said it myself, uh, uh, and she's at NYU and has talked a lot about uh, bipolar disorder in adolescence, but, you know, that when we look at the DSM, it makes it look as though everything is clearly and easily distinguished from everything else, so that there are these sort of definitive borders between things, which is a great piece of fiction. But also when we have people with all these other overlying issues, so the prematurity, the epilepsy, the blindness, uh, the early hearing problems, I mean, a potential early hearing problems, it just makes it incredibly difficult to know what's going on. Uh, and, and I think in terms of determining services and understanding, I think it is important that we get a better assessment done with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. This was really helpful for me, uh, and, and I hope uh, of interest. We so, as I said earlier, um, our uh, uh, the our next um, uh, so uh, developmental disabilities research day is on June the second. I believe that uh, Sarah. In fact, I don't believe I know. So Sarah has sent out notices, and I think that the uh, education department of CPRI has also forwarded them. Uh, the guest speaker from outside is. Uh, David Wright, who is uh, in the, uh, uh, his PhD is in the history of medicine. And I believe he's gonna talk about the history of Down syndrome actually uh, from early on. Um, and, uh, and then the next developmental rounds are going to be uh, a presentation by uh, Ashley Galloway uh, and that will be on June the 8th. Uh, and so um, thank you everyone for coming. Here is one uh, oh, comment from Alexandria and you're welcome. Uh, and I uh, look forward to seeing everybody next month. Take care.